Good morning. Great to have you here. Welcome all those who are joining us online. You know, you have to think, sometime in the future, I don't know how long from now, historians will have to unravel what happened, how a generation of Americans, the culture we live in now, all of us, could, could be experiencing a, an oasis, I mean, relatively speaking to other times and places throughout all of human history, this generation, this culture, we experiencing a, an oasis of peace and prosperity and technological advancement, the pinnacle of, of life ease, material comfort, plenty, abundance, even, I mean, I mean, even those who are the poorest in our culture are still way more equipped in many ways than the richest in our culture 200 years ago. It, that there's something about having all of this that you would think, and yet somehow we're experiencing uh, an emotional epidemic of stress and anxiety and unhappiness. Now, you might think, yeah, COVID, duh. But even before COVID, if you look at the surveys, you look at the studies, 2019, 2018, you saw this exact trajectory where people were saying that they were more stressed, more unhappy, more anxious than they were a year ago. Never before have we had it so easy, and yet we feel like we have it so hard. Now, I'm not saying that might be because we're just a bunch of whiners. That's actually what I'm not saying. I'm saying I wonder if it's true. I wonder, I just sometimes wonder, in spite of all the ease, if we really might have it harder than other generations, other cultures. That, that there, we, if we might have it harder because the very things that we thought, we assumed, would be the good life, bring the good life, abundance of material things, life ease, technological advancement, a glut of entertainment, knowledge at our fingertips, all these opportunities to never be bored, we thought that would bring the good life. What if that's actually the very thing that brings the bad life? What if emotional anxiety, happiness, stress is not really about having all those things, a glut of all these material things and life ease and entertainment and social media and access to all that. What if that's not the it, but what if it's spiritual in nature? What if really what we're having right now in our culture, in spite of the glut of all these things, is a poverty, uh, an epidemic of spiritual poverty? What if that the spiritual aspect that's becoming less and less accessible because of the time spent and the glut possible in all these other things is starving us to death in the ways that really matter most when it comes to happiness and anxiety and stress. What if we're, another way to put it, wiring our brains to not even be able to think along these lines, and so we're stuck in a situation where we can't even begin to find happiness? And emotional health. Because here's the interesting thing, that in recent years, neurologists have developed the ability through imaging and things like that to see something that we didn't know before, and that is this thing called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the constant rewiring of the brain. We used to think, I say we, I had nothing to do with it, but humanity, we used to think that this was all done in childhood, and by the time you became an adult, it was pretty much hardwired in. And that's been shown not to be true. Here's the thing. Your brain, my brain, is constantly rewiring itself based upon repetition of, of what you do, based upon repetition of what you see, based upon repetition of what you think, what you hear, what you say is a very powerful one. 
And the more these say and see and, and do and, and hear and, and all these kinds of things happen repetitively, the more your brain is developing new neural pathways to make that something that's easier to do. We used to call it muscle memory. Maybe we still call it muscle memory. It has nothing to do with the muscles. It's all about the wiring of the brain. Enough repetition makes something easier and easier to do so that... When our brain becomes actually hardwired to it and neural pathways develop and become super highways of habits, that we really start to think and we start to see and we start to feel and we start to say and we start to do according to the wiring of our brains, even if the wiring of our brains is not really a great grasp on reality and is missing something that might be the key to happiness and, and dealing with anxiety and stress, stress, emotional health. Seeing reality and how we see reality determines what we want. Uh, during the heyday of the COVID fears, May 2020, I saw this photo, and it's in a park, I think, in New York, but this is May 2020, and the way that the park was saying, okay, we're going to handle the social distancing is make circles and then clusters of people could, could hang out in circles. And if you didn't, you know, transgress your circle, you were being COVID safe. It seems like a pretty a good idea, although this person's transgressing mentally, not physically out of his circle. It's one of these things where, you know, sometimes I think we think of sin like this, right? We think of spirituality like this. We think of spiritual health this way that I'm spiritually healthy as long as I stay within this boundary of obedience. And if I don't step outside the boundary and transgress and sin, then I'm doing well spiritually. As long as I stay within the boundaries, this is, this is spirit, good spirituality. And different groups have, have different circles that you're supposed to stay in. That's not really the way Jesus talked about sin. That's not really the way Jesus talked about sin because Jesus talked about sin more as a dysfunction in the mind and the heart that saw reality a certain way and therefore wanted certain things based upon how it saw reality. A little while ago, I was working in my office on a rainy day and this robin was outside my office and it was just kept flying, there's a picture of it here, flying into my window just constantly flying. You know, five minutes, that's okay. But it was like an hour of just constantly flying up and down and and crashing into my window, and I couldn't work. It was driving me crazy. And and I felt sorry for it because I I knew, right, whatever had gotten into this bird's brain where they thought it made sense to keep crashing into my window, I knew that whatever this bird wanted was not going to be in my window. And yet, I kind of feel like, in some sense, the way the bird saw reality made it make perfect sense, and it was just obviously causing, to some degree, after an hour, self-destructive harm. The bird was starting to hurt itself. And and I think sin is like that. Whatever happens, our brain gets wired where we see reality a certain way so that it makes perfect sense to us. And what we want, because what we think we want is based upon the way we see reality, it makes perfect sense for us to have certain things that we pursue, even if they're self-destructive. Now, keeping that kind of picture in mind, it might help us understand what Jesus said, an amazing thing that Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 24. Jesus is having an argument with some people, some Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. And the argument is getting intense. And this one of these arguments is kind of going from bad to worse. By verse 44, Jesus is going to tell them that their father is the devil. And by verse 59, they're going to try to stone him to death. So we're kind of right here in verse 24 of a conversation that's going bad. And Jesus said in verse 21, You're, you will die in your sin. And now he says in verse 23, he continued, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am, you are of, of this world, I am not of this world. 
Now, that sounds a little esoteric and kind of strange and mystical, but Jesus said stuff like this all the time because, see, Jesus saw himself as coming from another realm, coming from the kingdom of heaven, bringing the kingdom of heaven back to earth. And he saw earth as in this desolate spiritual wasteland. And Jesus saw not just the physical world like we see, but he saw the spiritual world and the physical world as a symbiotic reality, that they were, the two were going on all the time. So he, he could interact with God and, and as if God was right there. He could interact in some, with angels as if they were, and they were right there, with demonic spirits as if they were right there. Jesus didn't have this sense of just seeing the physical world. And so people walk around in his mind in this world in this condition of only seeing the material, only seeing what's in front of them, head down. And so seeing, he's not saying from below in the sense of like there's a nether world, but below in the sense of missing the vertical, that the vertical reality of the presence of God permeating everything was something that the pe- people in this world completely miss and see life only horizontally, see what they want or only horizontally, seeing reality only horizontally, and missing the vertical reality of the pre- reality of God completely. And Jesus said, "This you can't even see straight. Your head's down." And so He says in verse twenty-four, "I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am He. You will indeed die in your sins." Now that's a really heavy statement, right? I, when people say, you know, I, I, I don't believe Jesus is God, but I really like his moral teachings, I don't know if they've read that verse, because that's a pretty heady verse. No mere human being could ever, should ever say anything like that unless it's true. But Jesus says, unless you believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Now, you can see what I've done here, right? This yellow, I am, We're doing a sermon series on the I am statements of Jesus, so you've gone ahead of me. Here's the thing. The English translators are doing a great job making sense out of what Jesus said by putting it in English that way. That's perfectly great, but that's really not what Jesus said, not according to the original text that we get when we read the original um, language of the Gospel of John. Jesus just simply said, unless you believe that I am not I am he. So let me, let me just get technical here for just a minute. I want to show you something because I want, I want you to see a hyperlink that Jesus is doing with the Old Testament. So let's look at the, this verse in Greek. Now, I'm not saying you have to read Greek. You'll be able to see what I'm pointing out though. That, that for, for unless you believe that I am, no he, but just I, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Now, that phrase, ego emi, I am in Greek, is going to make the listener hear something, and it's going to make the original readers read something. Because, see, the most common Old Testament in Jesus' day was not the Hebrew Scriptures. The the Old Testament was written in in Hebrew, but the most common translation was a Greek translation. So that when the New Testament authors quoted the Old Testament, they quoted from the Greek translation called the Septuagint that was translated a couple centuries before Jesus was born. And so what Jesus is doing is he's going, now stick with me, I'm going to be heavy for one more minute, that what Jesus is doing is using the language that they would have read had they read their Old Testament in all the places that God calls himself the I Am. Because in that translation, it appears exactly that way. So, for example, in Isaiah chapters 40 through 55, it's kind of like a pinnacle section of the Bible where God keeps repeating his claims that he is the I am and what that means for people. So, for example, we pick up in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25, and it says in the English, God says this, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Now, that's a great promise, right? Now, the people in Jesus' day, when they read the Greek translation of that, this is what they would read. I am, I am, 
the one washing your transgressions and never remembering your sins. I, I am. I am. That's all it is. There's no I am he. It's just I am. I am. Was what, and so Jesus is hyperlinking with that by saying, I am the one who washes your sins. I am the I am of the Old Testament. The I am of the Old Testament is the one standing before you right now. The one who called himself, tell them I am sent you. In Exodus 3, when he told Moses to go to Egypt, tell them I am sent you. And the next verse he says, tell them he is sent you. That Hebrew word for he is pronounced Yahweh, became the name of God. God said, this is my name from generation to generation forever. He is, is my name. And Jesus is standing before these people, and he's saying, unless you believe that I am, he is. I am the source of all existence. I am he is, who's the giver of all life. Everything comes from me. Reality itself comes from me. I'm the one who inhabits eternity for all reality. I am the one who's always present everywhere without being absent anywhere else. I am fully 100% present everywhere in the universe. I am the one who created the universe, and I am the one standing before you. And unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Now let's look for a minute because, see, when Jesus says, I am the I am, of course it makes sense that the giver of all life, the one who inhabits eternity, the one who is re- the source of reality itself, is not going to stay dead. He's going to rise from the dead, even when they crucify him. And so let's look again at what Jesus says. Jesus says, if you do not believe that I am, he is, basically, you will indeed die in your sins. Now, that's a, that's a heavy, unsettling sentence. Unless you believe that I am, he is. You're going to die in your sins. It's a serious, sobering sentence. And it's one of those places, I think, in the Bible where Jesus has so many, where he says something that has two meanings to it. On the one hand, I think he does mean that if you don't believe that I am, he is, you're going to die in a state of condemnation. You'll die in your sins and be condemned for them. But I think he's saying way more than that. I think what he's saying is actually incredibly freeing when we really understand it. And that is this. Jesus says, in some sense we could say, when you believe that I am, you will not die in your sins. In the sense that you will die in your sins if you don't believe that I am the I am, that I am he is, in the sense that you're, you're going to drown in your sins. You're going to die by your sins. Your sins are going to kill the life out of you. Your sins are going to suffocate you. Your sins are going to suffocate you like a soft pillow that smothers the spiritual life out of you as you develop this, this completely spiritual wasteland life. As your brain, we could even say, gets rewired so that you can't see reality outside of a distorted view of reality that makes you want distorted desires that are really not reality and that are your self-destruction and are going to leave you spiritually empty. And the more you pursue them as the is, because you think that is, instead of I am he is, you're going to drown. You're going to die. They're going to smother you. You're going to suffocate the life out of you. When Jesus says, I am, he is. If we really believe he is the is that we're seeking when we see reality a certain way that makes us pursue sin, instead of that, instead of our brains being wired that way, if we see Jesus as the is, well, we're going to see Jesus as the one who is the source of all existence. Everything in reality, we're going to see Jesus as the source of joy. We're going to see Jesus as the source of glory, of beauty. 
of wonder. We're going to see Jesus as the source of light and life. We're going to see Jesus as the source of belonging and security and gladness and flourishing and goodness. We're going to see Jesus as the source of true laughter and happiness. Because all of these things come from the I am. All of these things come from he is, the one who's the source of all these things. And so the more we understand Jesus is he is, the more we see that as the center of reality, the less attractive these dysfunctional desires in our mind and heart become. Now, it's not going to be easy because the hard wiring in our brain from neuroplasticity, right? Our brains are wired to think this way. It's not just a quick change. It's not just a quick belief. It's something that takes the same exact process that developed this now to develop a whole new way of thinking. And so suddenly we understand why God calls us to repeat worship. He calls us to repeat true phrases about him, to say them out loud, to see certain things that we do as part of worship, to sing and hear music together, to sing songs together, to be together physically, and to worship is actually things we do that are changing the very wiring of our brain so that we see he is as the center of our reality. We're not stuck just looking down at the horizontal of life and all of our circumstances are just based upon looking down, all of a sudden we're able to see vertically and we're able to see the I am as the overarching context of our life and that he is the source of joy and he is the source of life and he is the source of glory and beauty and belonging and security and gladness and laughter and joy. All the promises Jesus made when he says, I came that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be made full, that in the kingdom of God, there'll be this feast and this laughter and this time that you've always wanted to belong at the table comes from Yahweh himself, and there is suffocation and nothingness outside of Yahweh, outside of he is. Are these where your habits are? So that you can't even think this way. You don't even know what it means to want this way. It's time to rewire your brain through new habits of worship New habits of reading the words of Jesus, reading the words of God in your Bible. New habits of singing worship songs. New habits of reading certain things that are changing the very wiring of your brain. Not because I'm telling you to do's so that you don't step outside the circle. That's not it. But so that you can rewire your brain to see reality according to reality and therefore want the realest thing there is in the universe. And that's he is. But it's true. If we look at the verse again, it's true, Jesus says, if you do not believe that I am he is, you will indeed die in your sins. That there really is the reality. Our sins are real. We're accountable to God. But God, in his grace and love and mercy and goodness and joy and glory, he wants to share it with us forever. So he says, just like he says in Isaiah 43, if you just come to me, I am, I am the one who washes your transgressions and I will never remember your sins. If you come to me as the I am, Jesus says, I, you will not die in your sins, but you will live forever. Jesus is more because his love is more than my unloveliness. Jesus is more because his righteousness, his righteousness is more than my unrighteousness. Jesus is more because his cross that he died on is more than my sin, all my sin. Jesus is more because his faithfulness is more than my unfaithfulness. That's the gospel. That's why Jesus is more. Amen.